The background on why we're here and why we do this, um, the Administrative Procedures Act requires a, a certain level of public notice and public input anytime a organization or agency within state government is changing or creating new regulations. Regulations are what the DNR board passes. That's what goes into this guide and, and this is what we make changes to. Um, some of our rules, and, or yeah, I guess the rules that are in there are actually from statutes. Those are laws. We can't change those. Those are changed by the legislature. Um, a good example of that, many of you who have been to these meetings have heard this before, the deer bag limit is set in statute in Georgia. That means only the legislature can change the deer bag limit. We could, in theory, have a lower bag limit, but that was not the legislature's intent when they passed that, and so the board cannot change the bag limit, unless the state legislature decides to give us that authority. So here in January, everything's on the table, right? I'll talk a little bit about a couple of major changes that we're considering and that we want your input on specifically, but this is the time, whatever you've noticed or thought about, whether it's big game, small game, doves, waterfowl, your favorite WMA, uh, our private lands programs, anything, we want to hear comments on that. They all get read. If you email your comments, they get read. We'll take your comments here. Right now I have 87 emails. They come to my inbox, in the, my inbox and I read every one of them. We summarize that and that goes to the board. In February, based on the input we get from these meetings, from the public, from our agency staff, We'll refine these proposals I'm going to talk about, and we'll take them to the DNR board and we'll say, okay, board members, here's what we're planning to do for regulation changes. If they're good with it, which obviously that is not the first time we throw that at them, uh, then and they say, yes, your final version is good with us. We put it back out in April for another 30-day comment period three more meetings that we hold north, central, and south to do this again. So that if you missed the first one or you wanted to see a change, that is, that's the next opportunity to comment on that. At those meetings and during that comment period, while we'll still accept any comment that you take, what I do with those is I stick them in my folder for the next regulation cycle because we're only summarizing comments germane to the regulations that are being changed. They'll meet again in May to pass it. That puts us on a super tight deadline to get this thing out. We like to try to get it out in July, obviously before um, the, the small game season's open. Next slide. I have to give this little plug. Um, we hear it all the time when people are angry about wildlife. I pay taxes. You need to come get this coyote out of my yard. <laughs> Uh, super glad you pay taxes, um, but that doesn't pay my salary. You guys pay my salary, his salary, his salary, um, through license fees and then the matching excise taxes that are popularly called the Pittman Robertson Fund, technically called the Federal Aid Wildlife Restoration Fund. And so we are a user funded section within the agency. And so when we get private landowners that we've come to consult with who say, you know, can I pay you for your time? Well, no, you can't, but you can buy a hunting fishing license. And that leverages, uh, depending on the license in the year, it can leverage as much as you know, $40 for a license that you, know, you may have paid $15 for. So um, just a shout out and a thank you on how that works. Next slide. So when we're setting these regulations, Based on what the Wildlife Resources Division and the DNR is mandated by the legislature in statute, um, our first filter, if you will, is, is this biologically appropriate and scientifically sound? In other words, if you guys came to us and said, we would like to see a year-round season on quail. We'd like to be able to hunt year-round. That is biologically not happening. We will not entertain that. Okay? So, first, it's going to pass that hurdle. 
If it's something that's not going to harm the resource in the long term, then the next thing we're going to look at is what do our hunters want? There are a ton of issues, and some of us were talking earlier about, do you have an extra week of this or an extra week of that? Those are hunter issues. That's where we really need input because we want to do what the hunters want to do when, we, when that is our option. Um, something new that we consider is effects on R3. And if you haven't heard of recruitment, retention, or reactivation of hunters, that's basically the realization by state and federal wildlife agencies that are funded by hunters and anglers. Um, if people stop hunting, we stop having money. And look at the average age in this room. The numbers are bad. We continue to see hunters aging out and not being replaced by younger or new hunters. So we're trying to recruit new hunters, we're trying to keep the ones that we have, and we're trying to reactivate folks who have, for whatever reason, dropped out. Um, COVID was actually a big help for that. A lot of people start hunting again that had not gone in several years. And then this one, I'm considering reversing. Well, I just talk about trying to, I mean, this thing, you know. I've noticed that this appears in a lot of bathrooms. It's not exciting reading. Not the most user-friendly reading. Um, and so we are in a constant state of trying to maximize opportunity but simplify regulations. And I don't feel like we ever get there. And so I'm thinking maybe what we should do is take the opposite approach. I'm going to make this as complicated as I can. And if I fail as miserably at that as I have at this, it'll be simpler. But it doesn't work. So without further ado, let's talk about what we're really here to talk about. Changes that we're proposing. These are ideas that have come up from our staff, folks like Ivy, Lee, there's actually been one of the minor ones we're going to talk about tonight, came from law enforcement. Um, and these are, are not set in stone, okay? These are definitely open for discussion. One is adding bears to game check for the North Georgia zone. If any of you hunt in Central or South Georgia, it's a very different hunt setup. But in North Georgia, they hunt bears pretty much just like they do deer. We do collect biological data from them and therefore have a tagging requirement. But instead of what we've been doing now, which is the number they call this number or call that number, they get forwarded to the after hours number. We're trying to simplify it where they just game check it like they do with deer. Because most of our bear hunters also hunt turkeys or deer. And so they're familiar with the system, and so we think this will help. Another simplification. So right now in Georgia, as y'all probably know, you can shoot an any buck. Right? Or you, your next, if you shoot, say, whatever it is, your next buck score on the side. Um, this is going to change that four on the side or 15 inch outside spread. And basically, what that's doing is allowing you to shoot those big six points that anybody with eyeballs can tell is an older buck, but it doesn't meet the antler restrictions. We're not messing with Dooley and Macon County. If any of y'all were ever involved in how those came to be, but that sleeping dog's gonna lie. <laughs> um, we are gonna enact a, bail a daily bag limit for turkeys, and I have the numbers somewhere. Um, I meant to dig them up before we got started. Doesn't save a whole lot of turkeys in, in terms of number of birds harvested, right? I mean, how many of y'all killed two birds in one day? Okay, so three of us. Um, it doesn't save a whole lot of turkeys, but what it does do is encourage our hunters to go out in the field and hunt and then go home. The primary goal with these turkey regulations that we're going to talk a little bit more about here in just a second is not just to reduce the number of gobblers killed. Um, I, I do feel like I'm getting a little bit, as I get older, but I'm still well aware of the fact that males don't make babies. Um, so it's always been the males are somewhat expendable. Not totally true. We're finding out with turkeys that they have a very complex breeding cycle, and the primary goal is to reduce disturbance during peak breeding and when hens are first getting on those nests. Because the fundamental problem, and, and y'all all talked about it in different ways, the fundamental problem is there's not enough poults getting born, 
match not enough pulps making it into the humble population next year. And so what's causing that? And so we're trying to reduce disturbance during that key time in the woods, but we are also trying to reduce overall harvest on goblins. So to that end, obviously a, a one bird a day limit's not gonna do the trick. That saves you, and I can't pull the number up out of my head, but it's like maybe 1,500 birds, maybe 800 birds a year. We need some other options. And so this is actually gonna come out in a survey via email. So if you have given us your email and you have gotten a harvest record at some point, then you sh in the last year, you should get this survey. Um, ideally, we would only allow one bird the first 10 days and reduce the back of it to 10, to two. Uh, the logic behind the one bird first 10 days is kind of the same with the daily bag limit. We don't want people stomping around in the woods. They're, they're disturbing breeding behavior, they're disturbing hens as they're starting to get on the nest. The longer she sits on the nest, the less likely she is to abandon it. But when she first, she's laid one egg, she'll cut and run. So we're trying to reduce some of that disturbance. The bag limit obviously is one that is very powerful to most hunters, right? Why? Why are most people willing to go from three to two? Because they don't kill three. So the problem with that is it's palatable, but it doesn't make a big difference on the ground. Because the vast majority of us, I killed zero turkeys last year, and the year before that, and the year before that. So it's not going to make a big difference. But it's one that people are willing to support. It does save some birds, so we put that in there. Um, and then if the bag limit is not particularly palatable, you know, there may be some folks who are willing to go with the only one gobbler during the first 10 days. South Carolina tried that last year. Um, and our turkey biologist talked to their turkey biologist and he said, you know, COVID makes any kind of comparison out the window. He said, but anecdotally, we feel like it helped. We just have guys go out, open weekend, get a bird, and then they stayed home the second weekend. And so you just have a little less pressure out there in the woods. And the bag one was still free? For South Carolina. For with, with that third option where you said you Yes, answer. yes, with that third option, the bag limit would remain unchanged. Thank you. Now, some general WNA regulation changes, and if you've ever actually gone in and looked um, after that March board meeting, we put the whole board package up there so you can see every little change we're going to make. If any of you have ever actually read them, it's 200 pages. It's 200 pages. And these guys make all kinds of changes. But we'll talk about the ones that would affect a large number of WNAs. Um, the big one is we're going to delay the start of turkey season on all state managed lands to the second Saturday in April. We did that a couple years ago on Cedar Creek as part of a research project that's actually going to continue on, I think, for another four years. Um, trying to determine, you know, we know in Georgia that the peak breeding occurs in those first three weeks of the season. Whether we were here or not, that's when the birds would be doing most of their breeding. Uh, you see birds, I saw gobblers strutting um, Saturday afternoons, chasing each other and strutting. They were gobbling, they were just strutting. But it turns out most of them weren't even actually physically capable of breeding this time of year. So you see that behavior as part of their figuring out their pecking order, uh, but they don't actually start getting serious until the end of March. And so what we're hoping to do by moving them all to this later date is to take that pressure entirely off of our birds while they're trying to breed and get nests started. Once the hens are on the nest and they have their own pecking order, and they actually nest in somewhat of a sequence based on their dominance. But once they're all out in the woods sitting on nests, that's when those gobblers may not be displaying as much, but they're looking. They're more willing to, to cover ground looking for hens that are still willing to breed. This one, one gobbler per WMA per season. So basically, if we still kept, say, the three bag limit, you could go to Uchi and harvest a turkey. You could go to War Woman and harvest a turkey. And you could go down to Sable and harvest a turkey. But you couldn't harvest all three of them on the same WMA. Um, 
Um, that's another one of those where it's a really small number. I can think of two who work for our department before one's retired, Reggie and Chris. But again, it's kind of a good faith thing to try to, if we're taking away opportunity, we need to better distribute what opportunity is left, right? So one gobbler per season for WMA. And then that same one standard for quality bucks will apply on all of our quality buck WMA hunts. So instead of this, that, and the other, it's simple. It's four points on the side or 15 inches outside minimum spread. That's a legal buck for harvest. So first of all, how many of y'all have ever gotten one of our email surveys? So fair number. If you filled it out, thank you very much. Um, we send those surveys out sometimes to 50 or 60,000 people. And we may only get 5,000 responses, which is actually a pretty good response rate. But um, So thank you for filling those out. We're about to send out two more, hopefully this weekend. Um, one of them will go to everybody, since big game permit, it should say harvest record um, permit. We'll get a survey about the turkey regulations, and y'all saw what those options were. And then, how many of y'all filled out one of the dove season surveys via email? Yeah, it's, it's like the zombie issue that won't die. Um, and, and the issue there is that the Fish and Wildlife Service gives us 90 days, and it's when we can have up to three segments. And so, we're trying to catch, you've got your traditional opening day that most people don't want to mess with, even though it's hot enough to fry an egg on opening day. Um, and we've asked people, do you want to move it to sunrise instead of the traditional noon? Most people want to keep it at noon. Like, that would blood for punishment. Um, but the way we rearranged it these last two seasons, there's really nothing in October, right? So you've got September opening day to the 30th, and then it doesn't come back in until Thanksgiving, and then it goes out, comes back in in December, and runs all the way to the end of January. So this survey will be asking, would you be willing to give up some of that early December and tack that up into October to get some October dates? Um, this is a classic example of one where it's hunter preference. What do most of our hunters want? As a biologist, looking at dove season doesn't make much difference. You know, if you hunt past January 31st, you're killing birds migrating back, and that's really bad for the population. But in that framework, it, it needs to be up to the hunters. If you don't have a valid email address and you'd like to get these surveys, you have two options. One, go into your Go Outdoors Georgia account and enter an email address as soon as possible. Um, or, probably the easier way, take one of my cards, email me and ask me for the survey, and I'll send it to you. Um, next slide. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna stop me yapping at you. We're gonna go into the official portion of the meeting. So we are legally required to take your comments. And so what we're gonna do since we have such a small group is we'll just go person by person. If you don't have a comment, that's totally fine. Um, if you do have a comment, we'll take notes on that. Hold your questions to the end. Once we've gotten everybody's comments, we'll circle back and, and y'all can ask questions as, as long as we can all stay awake and we'll answer them as best you can. You can ask us. These guys are very popular. <laughs> they get lots of can I questions. I, I can go ahead and answer for you. If you're starting out with can I to one of these guys, these are no. <laughs>
or has questions or whatever, this is my email box. This just helps me keep all of these input emails from getting mixed into the you know, 100 emails a day that I get about other things. Email us and let us know whatever it is that, that people have input on. Um, I'd, I'd way rather have stacks and stacks of emails to go through than, than folks not, not say what they want to say. And, uh, you know, if you just make a comment, you'll just get an auto-reply, hey, I got your email. Um, but I get a lot of folks that have more in-depth questions, and I flip those out to those subject matter experts if it's something that, that I want to deal with. 